Well, hello, everyone. I think it's about time to, to kick this off. Hello to wherever you are. My name's Carl Apple. I'm the Director of Communications for Rice Engineering. It's uh, sort, of a, sort of a rainy day here in Houston. I hope it's sunnier wherever you are. Uh, good morning. Uh, it might be afternoon where you are. It might be evening where you are. Who knows? But uh, good morning. I'm glad you're able to join, join us for this Meet the Dean event. I'm here with Luai Nakle, the William and Stephanie Sick Dean of Engineering, who started in that role uh, around the first of the year. Luai, welcome. How are you today? Good. Thank you so much, Colm. I'm very happy to be here. I wish we had it in person, but we'll do what we can do with the, with the new normal for now. Can't, yeah, can't do this with a, with a live crowd quite yet, but soon, maybe, maybe this fall? Is that when it kind of looks like we might be on, on campus? Yes. All the plan now is for us to all go back to normal in the fall semester. I am hoping that even we will start going back to normal and back to campus in the middle of the summer as well. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that, for example, for all week and all these activities for the new, for the new class of students, that everything is going to be in person. Yeah, I think that uh, the reality is going to be right when we finally kind of got used to, to doing everything on Zoom, doing everything distance. Now we're going to have to get used to actually seeing people again and being in the same room with someone. I'm here on campus, ran into a colleague, and, and the two of us were sort of shocked to see each other in person, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of that effect. Yeah, I, I wonder how, if people are now going to know how to, to shake hands or whether they should shake hands anymore. We'll see. It'll be interesting when people get reintroduced back to, together. We thought that this event might be an opportunity for some of you to learn a little bit about Luai. Uh, the two of us will, will sort of have a conversation and then answer a few questions from you that were submitted prior to the event. Uh, you can continue to submit questions via the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, you know, Luai, you've been at Rice some 17 years in the computer science department, though it occurred to a lot of us that uh, that doesn't mean everybody knows you. And, and so, um, you know, a meet and greet in person would be the, the best way to do that. But uh, we thought maybe this would be a good way to sort of virtually let everybody get to meet you a little bit. Perhaps the simplest way to start this off would be uh, to make sure everybody can accurately pronounce your, your name right. Uh, would, you, would you for us, please? Yeah, it is Luai. It's, so this is an Arabic name. The, the truly correct pronunciation is Luai. Nobody can pronounce it like that, but I say Luai. So Luai is the right, is the right way here. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's Nak Lay. Nak Lay. That's yeah. pretty simple, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you can ignore the H maybe there when you pronounce it. So. We'll, we'll certainly talk about your professional accomplishments and, and we'll get to some of your goals as dean and, and some of the exciting things happening uh, in rice engineering. But I do want to start a little bit uh, with your background, which, which I find interesting. Yeah, so I, I was born in Israel. I was born in 1974, uh, actually on May 8th. So next week is my birthday, actually Saturday, I think. Next Saturday, yeah. I was born in Israel, but I was born to a Christian Palestinian family in Israel. So in Israel, about 80% of the population is Jewish. 20% of the population are Arabs. I am from the 20%. Within this 20%, the majority are Muslims, but you have other religions as well, including Christians and Druze and other, other uh, religions, as I said. So I am, yes, from the minority of minorities there. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in a small town in the north of Israel. So for anyone who knows Israel or the, the, the map of Israel, it's, it's about 20 miles from the border with Lebanon. Israel is very small. It's actually narrow and long a little bit. So it's very, when you, are, when you live in Israel, all the way to the, to the west, you know, to the Mediterranean is usually 20 miles to the east, which is, you know, the borders with Jordan or Syria, it's also about 20, 30 miles. Uh, the, I speak Arabic, my first language is Arabic. My second language is, I spoke Hebrew as well, because I went to college there in Israel and, you know, you, you speak Hebrew there in college as well. And then I came to the States in 1997 to pursue my graduate studies. So I did my undergraduate studies at the Technion, which is an Israel Institute of Technology in computer science. I, that was between 92 and 96. 97, I came to the States to, to do my graduate studies. I did my master's degree in computer science at Texas A&M University. 
that was 97 to 98. I was there really for a year and a half. Then I moved to UT Austin. And uh, from January 99 to May 20, 2004, and that's when I did PhD in computer science. Then in July or August 2004, I moved to Rice here, and I have been here ever since. And uh, you're, uh, you're a family man. I, you can call, yeah, you can think of me as a family man, yes. So I am married. My wife is Japanese, and I have two kids. Uh, my daughter is Brooke, she's 15, and my son is Dylan, he's 12 and a half. When did you realize that you, you either really wanted to pursue computer science or um, maybe uh, you had a knack for it? When did that really start to develop? So this, is, this was interesting, actually. It was in ninth grade. So when I was in, in school, we did not have anything called computer science or anything like that until eighth grade. Then in ninth grade, all of a sudden, the school hired this teacher to come and teach computer science. And students had no idea what, what, what computer science was. This was in the late mid 80s. Uh, nobody had a computer at home. Nobody could afford a computer at home. So we had a teacher who came to teach us computer science. Computer science was taught in a mathematical way. We had no access to computers. We did not program anything. Everything was about, here is a problem, come up with an algorithm for it. So it was all about algorithms. And that's when I fell in love with actually with the subject because it was about problem solving. And I would say it was a combination of two things. One is it is problem solving. And I enjoyed that seeing, you know, how we use mathematics and, and this way of reasoning about problems. But at the same time, the teacher was excellent. And I would say that always, you know, having a good teacher in a specific topic is a key factor in, in a student liking a certain uh, subject. So this is where it started. I, uh, I took this uh, computer science that year, again, without seeing a computer, without writing program. And then the second year, I also did it in 10th grade. We did it in exactly the same way. It was more algorithms, more mathematics. We didn't see a computer or anything like that. And that's where I started getting interested in it. So when I finished high school, I applied. In Israel, it's different from the US. The system in Israel, you apply for a specific major at the university. You don't apply, like here at Rice, student apply, say, I want to study humanities. Then you come here and choose what you want to study. In Israel, you know, you apply and say, I want to study computer science. So you are accepted to that department. And if you want to change, you have to apply again to the, to the university. So I applied uh, for computer science. I, I, I was torn between computer science and physics. So I liked always mathematical fields, math, physics, and computer science. I applied for both computer science and physics. I got accepted to both. And then you know, I thought about it, which one really um, uh, interests me more. It was computer science, and this is when I started. And that year before I started college is when we bought a computer. So the year after I finished high school and before, so I took a year off. The way in, things work in Israel, you have to have a year off because of certain grades that you need them ready for, for college application. So that was the year before college when I bought a computer and I started learning programming on my own. It was Pascal and C at the time. I learned these two languages. I started writing some code. And then I started in, this was my first time I've seen a computer and I programmed on it and so on. That's it's kind of fascinating that, you know, just just having your hands on the technology, um, but at an older age now, I mean, everybody has you, your, your kids probably had an iPad in their hands coming out of the womb, right? I mean, that's that's how it is now. Really interesting that you, you didn't even have access to the technology until later in life. Which I would say it shaped my view of computer science and what I like about computer science, even students that I teach in class, they know that. So I am, this is why I teach courses in the department that are theoretical and mathematical in nature. So I don't teach any courses that are related to programming. And this is maybe has to do with how I got interested in computer science. What really attracted me to computer science was not writing code itself. It was the problem solving. How do you take a problem and reason about it mathematically and formulate it to be able to solve it? It wasn't really about writing the code or debugging code that excited me about the field. But yes, I mean, my kids now, they know much more about technology now than I do. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, the way it, it's, it's natural to them, really, the way they use these devices and computers and gadgets, it's natural to them.
So your research developed and, and, and into some very specific areas. Talk a little bit about that. So my path to research was a little bit uh, twisted in some sense. So the way I decided to go to graduate school is that when I was an undergraduate, I took a course that is called the formal, formal methods or formal verification. So this is, a, this is a course about how do you verify that the computer is doing what it's supposed to do? Or how do you verify that a piece of software is doing what it's supposed to do? We all fly on airplanes. Airplanes are actually flown by computers, right? I mean, the, the, the computer is, the, the airplane is on autopilot. You wanna trust the software, right? So, trust is not a word that we accept in mathematics and computer science. You have to really test that code and make sure it is doing what it is doing. So formal methods is an area that goes about this question of how do you make sure that the piece of software itself is doing what it's supposed to do, but you make sure of that mathematically. And this is actually a course that excited me about, there were certain topics, I don't wanna get into technical details here, but there were certain topics that were fascinating to me. I'll mention just one of them. It's what we call temporal logic. It's logic that allows us to reason about time. And I said, okay, this is exciting. I wanna learn more about it. And this is how I applied to graduate school. So I applied to do research in this area of formal verification. And I came to the States and, you know, there were certain things happened. I don't want to bore you with details. So I started actually working with a faculty member at UT Austin, uh, who, who, who's one of the best known in the field. He ended up actually receiving the Turing Award for, the, for his work in that field. But at some point, something happened that I lost interest in it. I cannot describe what it is. Just, you know, one day I felt I'm not motivated by this anymore. And this is when at the same time, a new faculty member was arriving at UT Austin and she was doing computational biology. I said, what is this? I don't know what this is. So I started a conversation with her, what is this about? And then I learned it's about, okay, we are doing algorithms and computer programs, but to solve biological problems. And that's how it started for me. So I started, I said, can I join your group to, to learn about this and to start working on this? And I never looked back from that point. I mean, it, it, it fascinated me because that was the first time I also started having appreciation for biology. Seeing the complexity of biology, but also seeing the logic in biology was fascinating. And putting these two together was amazing. You know, you, you can use your computational skills and problem solving skills to look at questions like evolution and to look at genomics and to look at cancer and so on. And I would say also half of my PhD dissertation had nothing to do with biology. I looked at natural languages. How do natural languages evolve and borrow from each other and so on. So this is how it, it, it started really with one course intrigued me in, in my undergraduate studies. I said, I wanna know more. I went to graduate school, but in graduate school, these things are expected, you know, that you, sometimes you change direction, sometimes you even change advisor and so on and it happened. I'm not an engineer. When I uh, came to Rice Engineering, I was blown away by how much computational work is happening in Rice Engineering, and it's it's such a it's such a huge part of of modern engineering. It's 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 almost if you if you're uninitiated, it's 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 kind of the stuff that happens behind the scenes that makes everything in our lives happen. Yeah, I mean. Uh... I, I want to be careful how I say things here because, you know, as Dean, you don't want to, I don't want to sound like I'm still, you know, a computer scientist here or, or, or pitching for computer science. But I would say that it's not possible these days to find a field of study in engineering, in natural sciences, in almost all fields, in social sciences, that is, doesn't have a computational aspect to it. And computational aspect, I don't mean just, you know, using computers in a simple way computing as a way of thinking and computer science as a way of thinking is really changing these fields. So one of the, the, the cliches maybe today is that biology has become an information science now because you have so much data and there's no, no way you can sit and look at the data and try to make any, any uh, inferences from it. It has to be about computers. It has to be about computational solutions to be able to do research in biology, in biomedicine, in all these fields. But again, it's in physics, it's in chemistry, it's in all fields of engineering for sure. 
social sciences have been revolutionized by computing as well. Because, you know, decades ago, a social scientist will be interviewing 20 people or 50 people, asking questions, collecting data to make inferences about some question of interest. Today, you have access to data from the web on billions of users and billions of transactions. You can understand the economy, you can understand social behavior, you can understand many phenomena by analyzing data. But this data and this analysis has to be computational. There's no question about it. You mentioned uh, earlier, um, you know, a, a teacher who had a big influence on you. And then, you know, you've mentioned some mentors, faculty mentors. I, I know that switching gears, I know that's an important part of your, your job as well. I mean, there, there are some great faculty who are great researchers, maybe maybe don't take the teaching as seriously, or maybe great teachers, but, you know, this is something you, you take both aspects of that job very seriously, and, and you've been recognized in both areas. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the reasons that I joined the, the academia is because it's the, it's the one place I can do, I can practice the two things I'm passionate about, which is research and teaching. And I don't separate the two, really, I don't separate the two. When I teach my own course and courses, multiple courses, uh, if you look at the homework assignments I give, the, if you look at the way I present the material, it is driven by how I do research. It is driven by applications from my own research area. Uh, and the same thing when I to, do research, you know, a huge part of research is not just doing the work, it's also communicating the work. It's also mentoring students and working with students. To me, that's also part of teaching. Teaching is not just the classroom. Teaching is also mentoring graduate students, mentoring undergraduate students. For me, both of them are, you know, go hand in hand. This is one. And the second point is that I don't think a faculty member has to make a choice between the two. You don't have to be say, I'm either a researcher or a teacher, you can do them both. And I would say part of my style of leadership, whether I, when I was chair of the department or whether now as Dean, I like to lead by example. This is why I'm teaching as Dean. This is why I'm still research active as Dean. And this is why I'm still doing my job as Dean. I hope I'm doing my job well. You can do them. And you know, it's just that it's a matter of how do you view your job? You know, if when someone says, I cannot teach because I'm doing so much research, I don't think that is what's really happening. It is more that that person is putting different priority for research and teaching. Uh, no, look, there's no, there, you know, we have 24 hours a day and there's no question that, you know, if you try to do more of these jobs, you know, also it, you, know, you have to be careful about how you balance your time. But I would say that I joined the academia because I wanted to do these two and I want to try to continue these two as long as possible. I mean, things could change as, as I'm serving as Dean and we will see. And I mean, really what you're saying is one of the things that makes Rice kind of special, right? I mean, like the fact that undergrads, whether they're doing undergrad student research or whether they're, they're, they're taking a course, at many universities, many of our competitors, you, you, you wouldn't have access to someone with your credentials, some, someone, um, and, and here that's very common at Rice, which is kind of, that's, that's really cool. Yes, I mean, this is one of the things that we take pride in at Rice, which is we want everyone to teach and everyone wants to teach and we want the best uh, faculty members to teach the courses. Because again, I do believe that you can give, you can infuse so much into the course from your research experience. Now, I want to make it clear, you don't have to be research active to be an excellent teacher. We have, you know, as, as we know, for example, we have a large cohort of teaching faculty in the school and at the university who are outstanding and who drive the mission of, of the school and of and the university in terms of teaching. Many of them are not, you know, into research. They don't do research really. Their focus is exclusively on teaching, but they are also very innovative in how they teach, right? And I would say that sometimes this is where you see a difference that when someone is, is also research active and have a lot of research to, to do, sometimes they have less time to innovate or do the best, you know, in certain area. Uh, but, you know, I view both cohorts of faculty members equally and they contribute equally to the teaching mission. The, you know, having faculty who are research active teach is very important, but also I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna give the, the impression that those who don't do research are not doing a great job of teaching because we have excellent teaching faculty at, at the school. 
tra transitioning into uh, your leadership roles that you've had on campus, uh, you, were, you were named chair of the computer science department in uh, 2017. Um, what, what were you most proud of when you look back at, at your time as chair? So I'm very proud of my time as chair of computer science for multiple reasons. Uh, one, of course, that we expanded the, the, the faculty significantly. So during my time as chair, I believe I hired 15 or 16 faculty members. Uh, and at the same time, I also uh, secured authorization for the department to hire more, to grow the tenure track faculty to about 34 or 35 faculty members, which is effectively doubling the size of the faculty when I took over the department. One other thing I'm very proud of is uh, outreach events and activities that we did for the department. So we turned that into a very systematic effort, you know, with the help and significant help and leadership of, of Carl and Chatfield in particular, we, you know, we created what I would say is a great program of outreach for the department. We created a great community in, in the Department of Computer Science for our alumni. And this is something I was very proud of as well. Uh, of course, you know, working with the students and meeting with, uh, with uh, representatives from CS Club or Sisters and these clubs and, and listening to the students and seeing how we can improve things. I'm very proud of that because at the end of the day, students are really the, the heart and soul of the department. And it's very important that they are happy with the department. It is important that they are heard. And I made sure that they are heard. I met actually, I would, if I'm not mistaken, we had the town hall meeting with the undergrads every year where I listened to all their concerns. And I would say I acted on many of their concerns. The same thing with the graduate students as well. So I'm proud of what we accomplished. And uh, I am very, uh, I'm very confident now that uh, the new chair of CS, uh, Chris Germain is continuing to do great things for the department as well. You've been appointed Dean at uh, an exciting time for the School of Engineering, I think. I mean, it's a time of growth has been for a few years, uh, not only in terms of construction, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute, but uh, programs, faculty, new areas of research. Uh, uh, talk about this growth a little bit and some of the things that you're really excited about. Yeah, I mean, when I decided, when, when I accepted the, the job of the Dean and it was announced, you know, several people will say, are you sure that you wanna be Dean during this time? You know, it's COVID and also uh, all sorts of other issues. And I said, you know, COVID is really a temporary thing. I mean, we are starting to see the really the end of it, the end as in having vaccination and having uh, students and faculty going back to campus and so on. So I didn't let that deter me from, from the job. But as you said, Carl, it is a very exciting time for the School of Engineering. I would say I have very big shoes to fill with, you know, following uh, Reggie as our former dean. And then of course, Rob as interim dean. You know, lots of growth started under Reggie in terms of new research areas, in terms of growing the faculty, in terms of doing great work with alumni and with, uh, with outreach for, for the alumni of the school. And I will continue this. So I, I didn't come to a school that was stagnating in any way. The school was really uh, rising and um, I benefit from this. I cannot take credit for many things that are happening now, including the new building, you know, Abercrombie is going to be torn down very soon and the new building is going to be built there with, uh, with an opening date of January 23. I would say all the credit goes to, from engineering side, goes to Reggie for that. We are growing the faculty and we're going to continue to recruit more faculty. Uh, we are, even during COVID, we have not stopped hiring. There are, we are, we hired this year and we have Several offers are still outstanding for faculty members. Hopefully they will join us. Um, so we are very excited about this. As, as you know, uh, we will have new uh, research areas. For example, there's gonna be investment in quantum. Quantum, uh, quantum, we call it the quantum in initiative because it's not about just quantum computing. It's quantum algorithms, quantum complexity, quantum communication, sensing, and all of that. This is very exciting. And I, I believe it is the right time for Rice to invest in it because not many universities have big presence in the field and it is good for us to be one of the first places that establish such a presence. And neuroengineering has been extremely successful led by faculty members from engineering, of course, 
and it's going to continue to grow. We have new collaborations with the medical center in that, in that area. One of the biggest things that happened to RICE, I would say maybe in the history of RICE, of course, is the Welsh Institute, which was uh, funded and, and announced last year for $100 million. I would say that this is going to revolutionize materials research at RICE. Materials research has been one of the strengths of RICE for so long, but now I am hopeful that RICE will be on the map as the place, as the destination for anyone who wants to look at what's new in materials research. And this is going to bring people together because materials doesn't mean it is just about the material science department because materials, uh, you know, it's a very interdisciplinary field. So you're going to see chemists there. You're going to see people from material sciences. You're going to see people from chemical, chemical and biomolecular engineering. There's going to be emphasis on the use of machine learning in materials research as well. So all of that is going to create, you know, a lot of, of excitement and a lot of collaborations at RISE. So these initiatives, the new building and, and, and growing the faculty, this is all very exciting and we definitely want to push all these forward. And, and let's, let's talk a little bit more about, about the new building. I mean, some of the very specific elements of the plans are still being finalized. Um, and all the research areas you outline, I mean, you can almost, many of them, you could almost map out the building <laughs> with the areas, right? Because it's about creating a, a kind of a state of the art, right? A state of the art facility for, for these new research areas to, to really take off. Yeah, yeah. So then the new building is very, very exciting. It's going to be one of the largest on campus. It is going to be 250,000 square feet. The Welsh Institute will be in that building. But in addition to the Welsh Institute, and given that the Welsh Institute presence there, we will have almost everyone who does materials research. So we will have faculty from material sciences and nanoengineering, faculty from chemical and biomolecular engineering, faculty from chemistry. That's another exciting thing about it is engineering and natural sciences, not just engineering. And also, as I mentioned, the quantum initiative that is gonna be exciting. The plan now is to have uh, many, if not all of the, of the hires in the quantum initiatives being also in this building. So the building is going to be really about focused on research and, and graduate students, postdocs and research efforts. Of course, we, as, as is always the case at RICE, we want to hire as well as many of our undergraduates to involve them in research and give them these research experiences. It's going to be very exciting because it's going to, you know, Abercrombie has had a long story of success at RICE. So much great work was done at, at Abercrombie. That is the past, but it really set the stage for lots of future research. I mean, some of the most successful faculty members at, in, in engineering at RICE now had their career start in Abercrombie. And I do hope that this will be a similar situation here, that this building will put RICE on the map even bigger in terms of future research, whether it is in future computing, including quantum computing, or futures of material research. So we are very, very excited about this. And yes, there will be areas that nicely map into this new building. One of the elements that I know you're passionate about that's going to be woven throughout all of these initiatives and, and um, exciting new projects is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, I, and I know that's something Reggie and Rob also uh, moved the needle on. Talk about some of the initiatives in that area in the school. Yeah, thank you so much, Carl. I mean, this is something that I always say it's near and dear to my heart because of also my background, how I grew, I grew up, as I mentioned, in a minority. And I could see what some of the issues that minority students would, would face or minority faculty uh, would face because different minorities have different experiences. Not all minority groups are the same. This is not a homogeneous group here, but one, I would say one common theme to almost all of them is that when you go to, to a, a, a university or you go to a workplace and there are very few people who look like you, it's a challenge. It's a very, very hard thing. So it's very important that we work on diversity because there is so much strength in diversifying the faculty, diversifying the students. And um, one, of, one of the things I would like to look at is to start creating programs. First of all, I would like to look at what's happening in our school. So at the student level, I would like for us to start collecting the data to understand what's happening. You know, in terms of the students in the school, who actually comes to the school, who leaves the school, 
and why. Then we want to get to the why. Why do they leave the school? Why did the certain student come to engineering, wanting to do engineering, and then they left? In terms of getting the data, that, sh that should be easy. I mean, this is data we can obtain from RISE. Uh, in terms of the why, that's where we need to start talking to the students and we need to start having you know, meetings and, and town hall meetings to, to have serious conversations with the students. And I'm looking forward to that once we go back in person in, in the fall. Um, this is at the student level, we need to look into that. At the faculty level, one of the things that I'm very interested in is to, to try to create a program of you know, visiting faculty or visiting research fellows that where we bring them here to, to do research, you know, independent research with, with financial support. And these programs hopefully will attract these people to stay and to continue at RISE. Now, as you know, Carl, we have a lot of efforts at the school level, at the university level as well, in terms of improving diversity. And we have, you know, Associate Dean, uh, uh, Dr. Yvette Pearson, for example, she's one of the leads in the school on, on DEI initiatives for the school. And she's, she's, she is actually collecting data and doing studies on job interview for faculty members and what goes wrong during these interviews that we are, we as in engineering across the country, not just at RISE, that we start seeing bad, you know, bad, uh, you know, uh, impact on the pipeline. So we are, we are looking at many aspects of this, whether it is creating programs, whether it is looking at data, whether it is meeting, with, uh, with the right constituents to try to understand what's happening. And I think we, we can do much, much better. And uh, one, of the, one of the programs that in my, in my uh, opinion, we need to focus a lot on is the PhD program. Because you know, when we talk about faculty candidates or faculty members, faculty come from the PhD programs. We hire faculty who have received their PhDs. If the PhD program is not diverse, the faculty cannot be diverse because you're not going to have diverse faculty in the applicant pool. And we need to work on the PhD program. I do believe one of the issues with the PhD program and diversity is the financial aspect, the financial aspect. So if you, when I was growing up, again, as a minority, usually, I mean, very often minority students come from families that are financially not, you know, not rich or, you know, uh, not in, in the best possible situation. And here's where the, the, the dilemma happens or the, the, the decision making happens is that when a student finishes their undergraduate degree and they have a job from the industry and you try to tell them about graduate school, well, the job from the industry can pay them very well and that they can use that to help their families and, and so on versus a PhD program where it is five years, six years of ups and downs and so on, but with very little pay, right? I mean, the stipend for PhD students doesn't match the salaries that are paid in the industry. So we need to work on that. We really need to work on that aspect, the financial aspect. Can we get fellowships to supplement uh, stipends and so on so that we make it financially a little bit more, more comfortable for them? But also we need to do a better job at mentoring students undergraduates, all undergraduates, not just you know, undergraduates from, from minorities, all undergraduates about the benefits of graduate school and what graduate school is for. Because there, there are a lot of, of um, uh, you know, wrong ideas out there about what graduate school is for. One of them, for example, is you go to PhD, you do PhD only if you wanna become a professor. And many say, I don't wanna become a professor, but that's not true. I mean, you don't do PhD only if you wanna become a professor. There are lots of, of jobs in the industry that you have to have a PhD to, to do a great job there. And I would say these are some of the most exciting jobs in the industry. So we need to do a good job also at mentoring undergraduates and telling them about the graduate program and exciting them about a graduate program, not telling them it's, oh, it's a five year thing and it's gonna take long and you, know, you might be working on a project for six months and. No, I mean, there are lots of exciting things, actually. I, I always tell my students that my favorite part of my studies was the PhD time. I enjoyed it much, much more than my undergraduate studies. There's so much freedom. There's so much freedom in terms of what to, to pursue, in terms of your research and so on. And you travel and meet uh, exciting, interesting people from different research areas, different universities. 
So we have to tell all this to the students to also increase uh, diversity in our PhD program. Before we get to questions, um, you know, can, can you give us uh, a quick, quickly just sort, sort of an overview of, of this first year as dean like what, what are your goals this first year i mean i think a lot of times you hear well i just want to come in and listen you know well you've been here for 17 years so i think you want to do some of that but maybe not as much as, as others yeah no i yes i did i definitely wanted to listen because even as department chair you know yes i'm an, an internal person here i know that but i'll tell you that while i was listening and learning there's so much i didn't know about the school and so on but yes, I agree with you. Yes, I mean, there is time for listening. We need to do to get work done. Uh, so some of the, the, the stuff that I wanna focus on in the first year, I would like one thing that is very concrete. I would like to work with the departments to have serious committees in every department, each department having a committee that focuses on DEI. These committees focus on responding to events that happen and, and talking to students about them but these are also committees that do the programming for events and, and uh, activities in the department in terms of outreach and diversity. And these are also the committees that engage the faculty members in them. Another thing is of course, we need to work very hard on the new building. The new building, we are excited. It's, it's, it's gonna be built. There's no question about that. Demolition of Abercrombie is gonna start in a couple of weeks, but we need to raise the funds for that we need to raise uh, funds for endowed chairs to hire and retain the best faculty members. This is something that I will be focusing on a lot this year. In terms of, uh, of our PhD program, for example, this is something I'm very, very uh, interested in. I would like to look at certain programs that improve the, the recruitment and retention of our best PhD students and also the placement of PhD students. I was mentioning the industry and that you can get PhD and go to the industry, but I will tell you that when it comes to rankings of schools and reputation of graduate schools in the, in the country or in the world, it has to do a lot with where do the PhD students go. So we need to think about programs and, and, and activities that improve the placement of our PhD students as well. Uh, in terms of you know uh, hiring, we're going to continue to hire this, and I will continue to make the case to the to central administration on hiring in in almost all departments in the school. We definitely need to do that as well. So these are some of the things that concretely I will be focusing on this year. Let, let's try to get to a few questions. Um, there were a few that were submitted in advance. Uh, you know, and, and, and try to, um, let's see if, if we can get through a bunch. I, I know we kind of wanted to keep this close to 45 minutes, but we, we might go over, um, but uh, uh, this would be maybe maybe kind of our, kind of our lightning round. Um, what is your most innovative takeaway from the challenge of pandemic education? That's not a simple question, right? Uh, I mean, I, I would say that the most innovative thing is that you see that faculty members can adapt. Right, I mean, the, the sky did not fall because we had COVID. Yes, we went remote and so on, but you started seeing actually the ingenuity of faculty members and how they deliver, they deliver their courses online. You know, I speak from my own course. I would say actually my course is one of the easiest courses to teach online because it's really, I used to go and write on the board and so on. But seeing faculty members delivering courses that are lab courses, delivering them uh, online to students and still maintaining a high quality and students raving about the quality of that. To me, that was amazing. And I think this is one of the things that we need to think about post COVID is that how much of this we wanna retain, right? How much of this we wanna continue to use this, this technology and this ability to, to, to educate students remotely for part of these courses, how much of it we wanna retain it's an interesting question, and I think all universities are thinking about it. Um, I don't have clear answers about it because you talk to faculty members, you talk to students. I would say that general sentiment is that everyone wants to go back in person. People are tired of Zoom and people are tired of recording videos and watching videos. But when they go back in person, I think they will also say that or notice that there were certain aspects of online education that worked very well and they might want to still want that. And that will be something that we need to figure out and, and see how we, how we can continue to provide that. A question uh, from an alumnus. Um, I, I'm going to kind of sum it up uh, instead of reading the whole thing. You, you, you mentioned earlier that 
your outreach to alumni was a point of pride when you were chairs com of computer science. Um, he was wondering if, if other departments have similar programs and if this is something you hope to expand at the school level. I mean, I can I, I sort of answer that and that some do, some, some don't. Many of our departments don't have anything, some, some do. But the question is, you know, is this something you, you really would like to see expanding? We have a lot of alumni on this call for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So let me start with the second part of the question. At the school level, we definitely, we absolutely want to do this at, at the school level and for departments, for the, uh, also enable the outreach for the departments. In my four months now as dean, I've had already two meetings, great meetings with Adam Gottlieb, who's the, who's the president of the REA, the Rice Engineering Alumni. They are doing a wonderful job. The REA are doing a wonderful job in terms of, of outreach to the, to the alumni. Uh, and we want to continue this and we want to see how we can strengthen our connections with the alumni, how we can engage them more. And I, again, as I said, I enjoyed it in CS and this is one of the things that I would love to, to, to continue to do. And this is one of the things that we are, can't wait until this is the situation of COVID is over because these events are best done in person. You know, Zoom has its limitation. Yes, we can see each other and talk to each other but it was very different when we traveled and met with these alumni in person. Now, I wanna just go back this line, you know, and very, very quickly to the question about CS versus other departments, because it's very important to highlight here. I did it in computer science, other departments were not doing it, but not because other departments were not interested in it. Financially, we in computer science were able to afford it. If every department was able to afford it, I am sure that chairs would have also done it because chairs, this is what they love to do. I mean, they want to con connect with their students, with their alumni and so on. So we definitely need financial, we need to look at the financially how to support these programs and outreach. So I want to just make it clear that the fact that I was doing it for CS, maybe other departments were not doing it, not because I was better, we could afford it. I'm sure other chairs, if they could afford it, they would have done it as well. And, and, you know, C CS has certainly um, expanded, you know, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years to, to be, you know, one of the biggest departments on campus. Um, you know, one of our, uh, uh, one of our audience members had a question, um, is the CS department still exploding in interest? And um, how does the school balance that with other departments? And I would say to add on to that, especially since the new dean is a computer scientist. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> when I came to Rice in 2004, I was teaching courses. I used to have 18 to 20 students in the class. I literally used to grade the exams by myself and write detailed comments to every student. This semester I'm teaching, I have about 240 students in the class. It has grown significantly. It is not a growth that only Rice is seeing. Computer science across the country and almost every university, I would say maybe it's the most popular major now. It is driven, of course, in my opinion, it's driven by two things. One is the, the industry and the jobs in the industry. But the second thing, again, people are starting to see computer science is not just about sitting you know, in a cubicle and writing code. Computer science, you can be working on biological problems, on physics, on, 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 on medicine, and, and so on. So yes, computer science has exploded. I, I don't know if we are plateauing now or if it's, uh, but if we are still increasing, I would say it's very slowly now because for example, last year, I, again, I would not say that it is increasing anymore. Maybe we are adding two, three more students a year now, not, not more than that. Um, in terms of balancing it, this is always a challenge uh, because how do you balance things? I mean, one way to balance things is to say, we have a quota on the number of students per major or per program. This is not the Rice philosophy. In, at Rice, the student comes here, you are you are free to explore all the fields or the majors, and you are free to choose whatever you want. And do we want to change that? I don't think so, right? Because again, this is one of the the, the great things about Rice that students come here. I mean, I could come to Rice genuinely interested in philosophy, but somehow I take the introductory course in computer science and say, "Wow, this is amazing." And and that happens. That happens quite that a happens. bit, actually. Yes, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. It's not so. These are not students who are gaming the system. These are students who genuinely came for something else, took their introductory course, and said, "Well, this is fascinating. I want to change." Should we tell them, "No, sorry, you did not come here for computer science"? I don't think so. Of course, this is going to put a lot of you know stress on the computer science department. 
But I would say also the administration has responded. I am very happy to report that we have been growing and hiring faculty members. Also the department generously support courses. You know, we have tens of TAs, you know, some courses with 20 TAs, some courses with 40 TAs in them. So I don't, I don't know how to balance things across departments. I would say that every department has to do a better job at telling the student what's exciting about that, about that field also. You know, material sciences and nanoengineering should go during a week and tell very exciting stories to the undergraduates or to the incoming students so that they excite them about this field and they join it. Is, is that gonna now balance things? No, computer science is gonna, for the, for the foreseeable future, computer science is going to be the largest. But I say at the end also, we need the departments, the departments to do a better job about exciting the incoming students about about their majors and look at this. This is what a bioengineer does, or look at this. This is where the statistic, statistician role is. And you start exciting students and they will consider things you know, beyond computer science. The last point I wanna say about this is that you know, Rice is launching a major in business in, in, the, in the fall. Rice, we are launching a major in operations research in the fall as well. So these actually can start taking also students, uh, you know, can attract students that otherwise might have gone to computer science. Um, this is uh, per perhaps a, a little bit more basic of a question, but some someone asked if the stonework from Abercrombie is going to be saved. And do you, have, do you have the answer to that? I believe it will be saved, yes. And I believe there's some of the artwork on the, on the some of the stones have some artwork. It's going to be put somewhere in the new building, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Let's uh, let's maybe just just take take one more question. Um, there was there was a question that was submitted in advance that that I thought was interesting, asking how is Rice partnering with industry? I mean, we're we're in Houston, of course, which um, is the home to so many exciting industries. Uh, but asking how does Rice partner with industry to promote undergraduate success and exposure after graduation, and and in which industries? Kind of a big question, but if you can maybe touch on that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would actually start by saying, you know, regardless of what we do, we do specifically with the industry, I would say we are doing great in terms of job placement for our students and employment for our students. If I'm not mistaken, you know, our data shows that six months after graduation, fewer than or less than eight or nine percent of our students are still seeking employment six months after graduation. So over 90 percent of those, so 90% are either employed because they chose sort of employment or they are in continuing their studies, whether they are in a PhD program, whether they are in law school and so on. So we are doing great. I can tell you that when I was traveling and doing outreach for CS, there's so much demand for the right students because companies and the industry know about the strength of, and of, of the engineering education at Rice. In terms of what we are doing, I mean, there are efforts, RICE has, has efforts at the school, at the university level. For example, we have the CCD, the Center for, for Career Development. They do a lot of events, a lot of activities, not only the career fairs that they host, but also they do a lot of events all, all year long for the students. So we have events at the, at the university level. But if you look at the school level, just giving a few examples. Some departments have their uh, industrial affiliates program. So these are programs where they have affiliates from the industry who come to, this, to these uh, departments and present or listen to students. So this is one uh, avenue for, for employment. Some departments have their own, like in CS, we had what we call career mixer. It's usually around homecoming or other, other events where we have companies coming and presenting to the, to the students. We have our own Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, Renata Ramos. You know, in the last few months, she and the committee, the Committee on, on Academic Affairs of the Engineering Advisory Board held several panels on different segments in the, in the industry in terms of employment. Uh, so there are many of these, of these uh, things that are happening. Again, I wanna highlight the role of the REA, right? The Rice Engineering Alumni. They play a big role in helping the students with uh, with connecting them with the industry. Um, again, speaking of computer science, because I knew it best, uh, Rice uh, CS Club. You know those students who have worked in the industry. They will do help sessions to show students to look at students' resumes and you know give them suggestions how to improve 
also talk to them about the interviews and how to interview and how to prepare for an interview. So we don't have you know, one centralized program. We have a lot of events and a lot of activities, some at the university level, some at the school, some at the department levels. Luai, unless, unless you have anything uh, else to add, I, I think we're just about wrapped up here. Um, any, any final words for everybody? I would just say that I'm very excited actually to be dean of this school. I'm very excited about the future of the school. We are really excited about the new buildings and the new facilities that we are doing. And the last word I wanna say is that I appreciate these questions. I appreciate our alumni attending in particular, and we are always listening to their suggestions and we are always happy to answer their questions. So I really hope that whenever they have questions, whenever they have suggestions, we wanna be the best we can be and our alumni are in the industry and other places. If they hear of a good, a good program somewhere, or if they can think of a good initiative for improving diversity or any of that, we would love to hear from them. I assure them their suggestions and their emails will not be ignored. We would love to hear from them. So I'm looking forward to, to working with the school, with the departments, with alumni to strengthen our school even further. And I'm always, uh, you know, listening for suggestions and thoughts and feedback. And thank you so well, much, Bob. Luai, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. And thanks to everybody um, on the call. A really fantastic turnout. Um, be sure to follow Rice Engineering on social media and uh, any of the departments. Uh, they all have social media channels. You're going to get a survey sent to you. If you could take five seconds, fill out the survey, let us know how we did. That would be great. Otherwise, uh, 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 happy Friday and have a good weekend. Thank you.